Two times a week seems to be the kind of the sweet spot in, in the literature, but three times a week. Salut tout le monde et bienvenue sur le podcast Quantum. Je m'appelle Jacob Amel, fondateur de Quantum Training, auteur et formateur. Notre mission avec le podcast est de vous offrir les meilleures informations sur l'entraînement, la nutrition, la supplémentation et le mindset avec des experts dans leur domaine respectif pour vous aider à développer votre plein potentiel. Donc n'oublie pas de liker, d'aller faire un review sur iTunes et de t'abonner à la chaîne YouTube si ce n'est pas déjà fait et que l'épisode commence. Salut tout le monde, bienvenue au podcast Quantum. Aujourd'hui, je suis en compagnie de Dr. Scott Stevenson. Uh, Scott has a PhD in Applied Exercise Physi Physiology. Uh, you're a licensed acupuncturist and a competitive bodybuilder. Uh, you work in the field for more than two decades, I think. So uh, I'm really, really happy to have you on. So thanks for taking the time to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. I wish my French were better. It would be, <laughs> be a fun test of my, my knowledge base, but we'll have to do it in English, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my first question, uh, I want to know a little bit about your background, your story, and how and why you have started, started this journey uh, that lead to this day. I really, at my root, I'm just a very curious meathead is what it kind of comes down to. I, I played sports. I was a swimmer football um, in high school and when I started lifting weights as soon as I could like literally I wanted to lift long before my mom would allow me I think she she thought she believed that old wives tale slash myth that uh, lifting weights will stunt your growth um, which is rooted I think in the idea that you know you might have breaks somewhere near the growth plates and then, then you'd get a stunted growth in that particular bone but so I started lifting <clears throat> it's almost 40 years ago now when I could take a gym class and weight training. And uh, I just fell in love with that sort of simple act. So when I would train for sports, the, I loved the weight training. I, I literally, there are times like in high school, for instance, where the off season weight training programs were just, there was a couple of them were just ridiculous. And I was the only one who did them all. I just really loved the challenge and sort of the purity of it all. So I went to college. I didn't know I could even make a career out of something like this, really. And uh, then I started thinking, like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to find something that I, that I love to do every single day? And um, there were some options that probably would have sent me down a very different path. And uh, I just chose uh, trying to, at least at, at the beginning, become the world's greatest personal trainer. Sort of, I say that facetiously, but I just wanted to become really, really knowledgeable. Then I learned how much I love to teach. And that's what personal trainers, in some cases, not always will do. And from then on, I went to uh, earn a PhD so I could teach at the highest levels. Um, I've owned a gym in the past. Gosh, I started personal training people you know, well over 20 years ago. Um, now, gosh, it was, I, think I, I think I was ACSM certified in 93 or something like that. So... It's been almost, you know, we're getting over the 25-year mark at least. Started competing in the late 90s because you needed to do that. In fact, I, I competed when I was in graduate school. And at that time, this is sort of like what the, the – um, sorry, you can see my dog going crazy <laughs> in the background. It's kind of rainy today, so it gets a little stir-crazy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sort of ethos in grad school to some degree is that you just – you completely dedicate yourself – to academia and so I had to sneak around to compete for my first show like it was getting warm it was a summertime show and I was like wearing long sweatpants and sweatshirts because you could tell that I was getting ready to something was happening so I sort of had to you know do that on the sly so I've been competing now for 25 years or so 20 plus years and um, just trying to mix together and this is where I think a lot of people are drawn to me because I've mixed together and try to blend the science or pull from the science and, and gather the directional pointers that the scientific literature can give us as well as basically practicing what I preach in the gym. So there's, there's sort of two universes there in some people's minds. There are some people who are just, you know, all, you know, if the, if the legends didn't do it, if Ronnie didn't do it, you know, if, if then there's really no reason to worry about that. And then there are some people who, who literally take, they try to take the research literature, this is at one end of the spectrum, not everyone, of course, but, and they, they suggest that if it hasn't been demonstrated in a study, then it can't be real in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so I blend those things together in ways that I think people appreciate. So that's, 
that's probably why you, I find myself here speaking with you is, is that combination of, of um, overlap that I try to bring to the table to help people learn how to, how to become better meatheads, basically. Yeah. That's what it comes down to, the large figure, at least for bodybuilders. Yeah, for sure. And can you explain a little bit your, uh, your structure around 42 training? How do you mix things and what's, what's the big picture of that? Yeah, there's two ways you can go at that, actually. That's a good, a good question based on what I just said. So one way of looking at, at, at this sort of from the kind of layperson's view or someone who's been just training in the gym is we know, although it's not the only strategy you can take, one of the best strategies that people will often take in trying to prioritize a weak muscle group that doesn't seem to grow very well is to train it more often. <clears throat> people do it with calves, of course, is the obvious one. But people do it with arms. People say, oh, you know, I'd prioritize my back by training it twice a week. <clears throat> so we see that we know that's the case and if you look at just various aspects everything from language acquisition to getting a sunburn versus a suntan getting a callus the response and adaptation pattern that you tend to see that makes sense sort of teleologically and evolutionarily is that you would it would require somewhat of a repeated consistent exposure to some stress in order to do a bulk and adaptation. So more concretely, if you want to get a good tan, you probably wouldn't go and spend an hour in the tanning bed once a week. You'd just get burnt, and then you'd maybe recover, but you would never develop that tan that you want on the skin. And so the same thing holds true. I think this is why people would train more frequently, is that they really want to send a signal that there is a need to adapt hypertrophically to the resistance exercise stimulus that you would do it more frequently. So this is something that I, I sort of came to years and years ago, and then, I, and then I came across dog crap training, DC training, which is sort of renowned as a, a higher frequency training regime. And the literature was starting to develop at the same time too, showing that there's possibly some benefits to higher frequency training for individuals. So You look at mo the way most pros train, IFBB pros, the biggest uh, freaks in the bodybuilding world, and they will train typically with a higher volume, not always, but many times. Dorian Yates didn't, for instance. Um, like a freak that's well known today is Jordan Peters. He's in the UK, and Jordan and I have worked together as a good friend of mine. And so he trains with a, a higher frequency or a more effortful type of um, training structure basically it's it's really really progressive overload in terms of the weight on the bar as opposed to the training volume so the thing that is an issue there in taking from what the i the biggest freaks do especially most of the ifb pros is that those people are categorically different more than likely from what most people are in the world those are the end of the bell curve And I can sort of explain that if you want to dig into that, or at least give you my, my reasons for why they, they think they grow so well. And there's a number of genetic factors that are involved. But thinking about the average person, which I would consider myself to be, and, and I literally, I spent a, at least a decade taking on that higher volume training approach, and it didn't really do very well for me until I really started to focus on becoming the strongest, most sort of impressive bodybuilder in the gym that I could. <clears throat> and so I took... Those pieces, look at the literature, everything from, for instance, um, the, the well-known, well-documented um, phenomenon that muscle protein synthesis is only elevated um, significantly for maybe 24, 48 hours most. So it makes sense then, and if we think about this from an evolutionary standpoint, that you would expose your muscles to a training stimulus every 24, 48 hours, like on a regular basis, not once a week. Now, there's some other factors that I think explain why once a week training, the quote-unquote bro split can be effective as well. But I came across that information, some of the frequency studies that have been done. Now, the sort of general takeaway, and of course, a lot of this is with untrained individuals um, starting off. There's not a whole lot of um, studies looking at frequency with highly trained individuals or at least recreationally trained. <clears throat> and even then, you need to read the, um, the subject characteristics. When you look at those, you know, three to five years of training and they're, they're still benching body weight as a one rep max. It doesn't, it doesn't but, you know, tell you that they're extraordinarily well trained. Um, but you do find that taking a given volume of training, so number of sets per week, and you tend to be able to recover from 
um, a larger training volume by spreading that out. So you might be able to do 10, sec 10 sets in a given workout, and basically you're, you're approaching quote-unquote junk volume if you try to go beyond that. You're not going to book a greater uh, adaptation. But if you were to do six or seven sets twice a week, that's something you can recover from over the long haul. And there is definitely a dose um, response uh, phenomenon when it comes to adaptation to training volume. So more is better to some degree. Um, there's, that's another huge topic that we could delve into. So I took those things and pieced them together. I also looked at the fact that we know that there's, there's some relationship between getting brutally strong and becoming really, really large. You can have very, very strong people who aren't that impressive muscularly, but there's going to be something if you take someone who's bench pressing 225 pounds, 100 kilos, and you take them to 300 kilos or 200 kilos. There's going to be, you're going to see that in the musculature that's worked there. So heavy training works. There's also a, um, uh, a growing body of literature that the pretty well substantiates, even the blood flow restriction literature demonstrates muscle growth with just 20% of a one rep max. So high rep sets, if they're taken to failure, especially can also produce muscle growth. And um, there's also another way, and this is something that I, that I found with dog crap training, cluster sets. There's various types of those that are out there. And there was one particular uh, uh, kind that was in a program called Titan Training by Leo Costa. And I just borrowed his name. He had written out a, a muscle round in his own formulation that, that I couldn't make total sense of. I way overdid it. And there's a story in my Fortitude Training book, which you may have read. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I literally overtrained myself. I, 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 I pushed way past the limit and I had to pull, pull back. But I learned a lot from that. So cluster sets, the way I formulated them, are a way to impose relatively more stress on the musculature, which I think has an extremely good ability to respond in terms of muscle growth relative to the inroads you make on the nervous system. So really our nervous system and its connections with the endocrine system and the immune system are the things that those are the limiters to how much training volume we can recover from to some degree. Everyone's going to vary substantially here. But so I put together resist fortitude training based on this idea of train the muscle frequently three times a week. Um, there's even one version that's a four time a week training plan and not everyone can get away with that. It's not necessary for many people, but three times a week is sort of one end of the spectrum. Two times a week seems to be the kind of the sweet spot in, in the literature, but three times a week, it also works as well. There's a, there's a blood flow restriction study um, that was done in Japan, I believe, and they trained 12 times over the course of, or it was like 12 times a week, I think it was twice a day for two weeks, and that was the greatest rate of muscle growth. Very short study, but so higher, higher frequencies can be done. Put the higher frequency in the, into play, put the heavy sets, the higher up sets, and a cluster set into play. And then recognize that there are different abilities to adapt to different training volumes. So I have volume tiers that are built in. And that, that covers to some degree the ind individual variability in recoverability and how well people can bounce back from a, a training session. And sort of put those as the ingredients into the Fortitude Training Stew and then came out with the book. With There's some other pieces in there. But those are the basic ideas is to try to figure out a way to get people who don't have the, I just go in the gym. It doesn't really matter what I do. As long as I train reasonably hard, I'm going to grow really, really well type of genetics and try to fashion together the bits and pieces that will make a difference for them um, into one program. So yeah. that's where fortitude training came from. And uh, it's available on your website there. Eh? Yeah, you can just Google Scott Stevenson bodybuilding and you'll get, I've got numerous URLs, but you'll, you'll find it pretty easily. If you just yeah. fortitude training, you'll find it. You just yeah. Google that. Perfect. You, you mentioned a couple of, uh, of good uh, topics. Uh, genetic factor. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. So it, it's funny. There's the, this always pops up. We, you, you know, like one of the things that will happen when you see someone who is like a Phil Heath who will um, just just blow past their peers. Um, there's people probably know, have known these people. They played um, sports with them or they went to school with them or they did, they played music with them. And you can look at, you know, people, um, you know, 
Car- Carl Lewis or, you know, take, take any of the Olympic sprinters who are running sprints at speeds that 95, 98% of the world could never even approach probably within a second. No one really balks at that unless you really wanted to be a sprinter. Um, you take people who have Einsteinian like, uh, um, intelligence and people just, well, yeah, he's just got, you know, good genetics for intelligence. You take height, like, gosh, I really want to be six foot four. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen where it's not good. That's just, there's a genetic co- component to this. So across all sorts of aspects of human phenotype, um, you find that there's maybe like a, it's roughly like a 50, 50% um, uh, variances explained by genetics. So nature versus nurture, your environment, which you're exposed to growing up. So those things can be manipulated. Um, so that's, that's the first thing that's kind of hard for people to kind of grasp when it comes to your body, because especially if you're a bodybuilder, because your self-expression of like literally your willpower and your you know, your, your desire to achieve something really, really amazing and extraordinary is in how well you can produce an extraordinary physique. And to know that, like, there is just limitations is, is a hard thing for people to grasp. But there certainly are. And, th- and they've demonstrated these things in numerous ways. So there's a whole body of literature that's kind of growing. It's pretty cool. One of the, one of the important things seems to be the number of satellite cells a person has. Um, at the start and the extent to which um, the satellite cells are turned on in response to resistance training regimen. So satellite cells are uh, basically kind of muscle-specific stem cells. They're non-differentiated. They're not contracting. They're basically just nuclei that are waiting to respond to an injury, which resistance exercise could be considered. And they undergo a a proliferation and a differentiation response, so they make copies of themselves. And then those nuclei that are created from the copy of the satellite cell will make their way into the muscle cell and provide a locus for nuclear control in that cell. So as a muscle cell gets bigger, and muscle cells are very, very big in the first place, um, the the, the general thing you'll see, there are certain exceptions to this, but the general thing you will see in, especially with resistance exercise, in, in most models, not always, there's still some debate about you know, how absolutely pertinent this is, is that you'll need more of those nuclei because the cell's growing so large that if for a larger volume of cell, you simply need to have more nuclei to govern the protein synthesis, all the repair, everything that's going on in those areas of the cell. It's, I always liken it to the analogy of um, a growing city and the number of post offices it has. So if you've gone, taken a city from 1 million people to 2 million people, you're going to need to populate that city with more post offices um, because you've got more packages coming in, more packages being delivered. Am- everyone's using Amazon Prime and UPS sometimes takes over for that. So you need to have more post offices. Otherwise, you just couldn't get the job done with the original number of post offices. So people who are, tend to be genetic responders or extreme responders have more of those satellite cells. The myotropic factors like IGF-1, myogenin, those sorts of things that get released to turn on that process that the satellite cells undergo are released in greater amounts where the MRNA is higher. So various, uh, basically the simple response to a standardized regime is such that those people tend to set that process in motion better than others. And here's where I think genetics come in. This is just my own kind of running uh, hypothesis right now, is if you look at the data on that process, it seems like it's something that's, that's, that's going on for at least a week, um, if not even longer than that now. So that seems to be quintessential. That's a Im- very important part of the muscle growth adaptation, hypertrophy, that's what we're thinking about here specifically. And if you're someone who has good genetics, And a single bout of exercise turns on that process that lasts for a week, then there's really no reason to train again. You've already set the boat in motion. Um, There's no reason that you're going at the speed that you can go to make the cells bigger. So there's no reason to paddle with another workout. Now, if you're someone with not the best genetics or perhaps with a stubborn muscle group, which may, I haven't seen people um, do this. I'm, I'm, it would be really fascinating to find, um, to find out if 
to some degree, the reason why certain muscles grow more so than others within an individual is because they have more or less satellite cells or a greater or a lesser response to a given training bout in terms of turning on those satellite cells. But if you're someone who doesn't have that robust response to a, a particular workout, you might, be, you might be sort of setting the process in motion with one workout and maybe, you know, in some areas, potentially reaching a critical level for uh, the satellite cell proliferati proliferation differentiation, but other, other places not. But if you can hit the cell again, if you can train the muscle again and repeat that response, then perhaps that's what you need to keep the process going in a way that does lead to better muscle growth. That's why so, told, uh, before that the bro split can be good for some people that have like gen genetics, uh, more habilitation to uh, take the, the, satellite, the satellite cells to the muscle. Yeah, they, they tend to be, have more of them to start with, yeah. which is an advantage because you can get growth without Um, they call this a, the nuclear domain theory. So there's like a domain or a volume of muscle that's sort of the, the kingdom of each particular um, nucleus. So if you want a, a, a larger muscle cell, you need to have more nuclei. Um, and you try to keep that ratio to some degree. So those people just, they have the, the possibility of actually growing um, and, and having more nuclei to govern the areas, which is probably an advantage too. Each nucleus is, is, is responsible for a certain amount of protein synthesis. And there's some interesting stuff that's come out in the last few years, for instance, at the beginning of a training regime where someone first starts training, there's a protein synthetic response. Day one, you go in, and the idea has sort of been that that is a surrogate for how much growth adaptation they'll get over the course of a three- or four-month training program. So... The people with the most robust protein synthetic response would, you would think, have the most robust adaptation in terms of muscle growth. Well, if you look at the beginning, like day one, that's not the case. And the thing that differs day one, for instance, versus two or three weeks into a program is that you've got a lot of, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> Blitzy, Blitzy, it's okay. Hey, good girl. Hey, Blitzy. No. Good girl. Hold on a second. Blitzy, come here. Little girl. It's raining, so they, they go outside normally. So now they just stay inside and bark out of frustration. <laughs> um, so you would expect uh, the thing that's different about that first training um, day is a lot of muscle soreness, a lot of muscle injury. And there's a repeated bout effect phenomenon or protective effect of that first bout such as you don't get nearly as sore the next time you come around. You don't see the same level of inflammation, muscle soreness, DOMS, all those sorts of things. So that first bout really doesn't tell you much, but if you wait two weeks in, three weeks in, and, and DOMS has done this, this particular research, they've done a lot of really cool stuff. I really like what they've done. And then you measure protein synthesis three weeks into a 12-week training program and correlate that with muscle growth, you get correlations on the order of like 0.8 out of with one being a perfect correlation. So someone who's got a lot of myonuclei, and that wasn't measured in that particular study, but they simply have, for a given volume of muscle cell, be it big or small, if they've got more myonuclei or a higher myonuclear density, they have a greater capacity for protein synthesis. So that's one thing that's, that seems to be pretty important as a satellite cells. There are things called microRNAs, which are involved with sort of metering out which, which uh, genes get turned on and which, do which don't. And variations in those microRNAs also have been uh, associated with, with muscle growth, too. So um, if you look, for instance, just at the muscle soreness, you can look at muscle soreness and DOMS and muscle injury. There's variations there in, for instance, the IGF-2 gene, which is sort of an interesting one. We talk about IGF-1 all the time, but variations in the IGF-2 gene seem to be uh, Im implicated in the now it's muscle soreness some will have. And soreness, we think about when you're going to be able to come back and train again. Soreness is, it tells you something. Obviously, the muscle is so sore, it's sore to touch, or any stretching really, that's probably not the best time to go into training again. 
you want to have some some uh, measure of recovery before you go and hit it again with another workout. So people who have variations, for instance, in that or variations in soreness in general are probably going to have to wait longer or train with a lower volume if they want to train at a given frequency because they just can't recover from higher training volumes. So there's an, there's, there are genes involved with muscle soreness that are they're structural genes. There's the IGF-1. Um, I think interleukin-6 as well. One of the interleukins has been involved. I can't remember. I think it's interleukin-6, which has anabolic effects, but it's also involved with inflammation. Those all play a role in muscle soreness, and that has, that has an overarching effect on how often you can come in and train. So if we take that basic notion of a dose response in terms of training volume, if you're someone who recovers quickly, you can train with a higher volume. You can turn on protein synthesis more often, have a greater area under the curve, so to speak, in that particular response. And when it comes down to it, eventually, you're going to have to have um, protein synthesis exceeding protein breakdown over the long haul if the muscle cells are going to get bigger. So that's just looking at it from a hypertrophic um, yeah. uh, there's, there's actually some really interesting data that people sort of forget in the grand scheme of things that was done like back in the nineties, uh, and looking at biopsies of advanced bodybuilders and, and Jose Antonio, uh, references that mm -hmm. this in, uh, in the context of hyperplasia and these studies demonstrated that in, in bodybuilders with very enlarged muscles, one and a half, two times bigger than the controls they had muscle fibers, which were the same size. So either there's some kind of a hyperplastic adaptation that happened there, so they ended up with more muscle fibers, or maybe they start off with really, really small muscle fibers, and then they grew them to average size, and that's why the muscle got bigger, which is probably unlikely. So um, one of the things that he's found, and this, is, this, this points in the direction of maybe higher volume be, training being um, something that could help certain individuals and maybe only those with the best, the best recovery ability, best recovery genetics. <clears throat> he did a, um, are you familiar with the quail um, overload studies where they would put weights, the uh, stretch overload yeah. studies? On the bird? On the bird, on the quail, yeah. So for those who aren't familiar with this, it's, it's a really powerful um, uh, model for examining skeletal muscle growth. And it'd be akin to like taking a, like a dumbbell and hanging like a 30 pound dumbbell off, off someone on one arm and just watching their trap grow, Hope, hoping that they're, you know, they didn't separate their AC joint or what have you. Yeah. And in this particular study, they would just typically pick a percentage and, and they would, um, uh, you know, there'd be some manip manipulation in the various ways this model is applied. And they'd pick a percentage of body weight and they'd hang it there and they'd, they'd measure, you know, various aspects of the growth adaptation. Well, Jose did a study where they used progressive overload. They started off with a certain load and they went, I think, for maybe two days and then they took a day off. So we also recovered, added in a recovery aspect to the model. Um, and that's, that's obviously pretty important. That actually does a better job. Not that quails with weight hanging off their wings is the best model for resistance exercise, but it does take into account this idea that you know, the, the, there has to be a release of that stimulus for the adaptation to happen. You're not going to get increases in um, protein uh, accumulation while you're training. Protein synthesis is turned off during exercise because the energy demand goes to providing ATP for the contraction. So he would load the wings of these quails for, I think, two days and then take a day or two off and then come back with a heavier load for a couple more days. And he did that over the course of like 28 days. And the interesting thing was, if you looked at the, uh, it's the anterior latissimus dorsi, which, is, which would be like the trap if you were hanging the dumbbell off a person's arm, it grew over the course of this four-week-long study, maybe in like 31 days, something like that, but it was about four weeks long. It continued to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow all the way to the end. And so they had some animals they would sacrifice at seven weeks, and they'd see how much growth they had, and the other ones would continue, and then they just would eventually pull from the animals until some of them lasted until the very end of the study. But the fibers grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And then I think about three weeks in or so, the fibers started getting smaller while the muscle kept on growing. 
which suggests that, and, they, and, the, and the, actually the number of type 1 fibers increased as well, if I'm re recalling this correctly. That's what you see in many highly advanced bodybuilders when you take biopsies from them. Lots of average sized type 1 fibers in very, very large muscles. That's what was happening to this quail muscle. It was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the fiber type was shifting to a more sort of endurance fiber type and getting smaller. But they seem the, the only explanation that makes sense is that the growing muscle meant that the fibers were increasing in number. Basically, hyperplasia was occurring. So that's the thing that sometimes I think we have to, we wouldn't expect that to happen in four months in untrained individuals or three months. But over the long haul, I think there's, 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 that's something to consider in terms of what can make a muscle bigger in bodybuilders who've been doing this for eight or 10 years. And, you know, studying them for that long is going to be hard to do, especially taking biopsies from the precious muscles they tried to, you know, make so large. So at any rate, that's, that's a long answer to the genetics idea, yeah. but there's a lot of things that are involved there. You just literally, you see it, drug metabolism also plays a role. If we, if we talk about PED use, and there's a whole whole litany of things related to anabolic steroid metabolism, both pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. So what your body does to the drug and what the drug does to your body. Um, GH, probably the same sort of thing is going on there. So all of those drugs have variable effects on individuals. And some people seem to respond better than others when it comes to that. So um, that's just a, a, a kind of the tip of the iceberg when it comes yeah. to this. Yeah. And do you think that like the, there's some kind of uh, workout technique or uh, maybe to put more uh, muscle in the stretch position, position or uh, have more muscle damage that will affect the satellite, satellite cell proliferation and myonuclide domain and everything? You, you do see more robust responses to eccentric um, contractions versus, versus concentric. Um, eccentrics also tend to increase more so the, the, the size of a muscle at its ends near the tendons. And, and that, that kind of makes sense. What, and what's in the, the fascicles or the alignment of the fibers along the tendon or tendons of the, of the, um, of the muscle tends to change as well. And that sort of makes sense. It's, it's changing in response to forces which are so strong or which are strong enough to cause a high tension while lengthening. So if the muscle, the muscle wants to basically adapt to whatever stimulus it's given, in this case, if you, if you are a smart muscle, again, this is a sort of a teleological explanation, but it makes sense and it's easy to remember in that way, is that if you're, if, if you're in a situation where there's so much force that you're, the mus that you're lowering the weight or, or the muscle's being lengthened while it's contracting, That's not typically what you might see during normal day-to-day -day activities. Um, it's a bizarre thing. I always say it's an unnatural act to pick up a weight and put it back down and pick it up and put it back down. And pick. Just repeatedly doing that is, is something you would, you'd rarely would see. You're either going to lift things continuously or you'd just lower them if you're taking things off up, you know, from a higher level to a lower level. But up and bound, back and forth, that's resistance exercise. That's, that's sort of like... I mean, you can imagine aliens coming down and, and they see these, these people that are, you know, just like picking things up and lowering them. It was like, what, what are they, where are they going with this? Why are they doing this? So back then to an eccentric contraction, repeated exposure to eccentric contractions, you can just do eccentric only with an isokinetic machine, for instance, or just do lowering only um, in an experimental setup. Um, that's threatening lots of force and the muscles being lengthened. So if the muscle could somehow lengthen itself or adjust the length of the fibers or the actin and myosin so that it can produce force at that, at that longer muscle fiber length, it would do so. And that's basically what you see in terms of the changes in, in fascicle angles. And the fact that you get more um, muscle growth near the ends of the muscles where the tendons and the muscle, the myotendinous junction, that's a place where you can often see tears. So it's the muscles kind of protecting itself against the overload that comes with eccentrics. And eccentric, the amount of force produced during eccentric contraction in the fibers that are active could be 30, 40% more, if, if not much more, depending on what speed of contraction you're comparing 
factor in the concentrics. So literally there's a force velocity curve for skeletal muscle. So maybe in, in isolated muscle, you might produce 40% more force during an eccentric contraction versus an isometric. And then the max force you can produce during a, a concentric can become less and less and less the faster the contraction. So if you compare the amount of muscle it takes to lift the weight up versus what has to happen in order to lower it, you're using much less muscle on the lowering than on the lifting. So the force per unit muscle is much greater on an eccentric contraction than on a concentric contraction. But the metabolic stress and the, and the, the metabolic energy demand is much greater on an eccentric, or sorry, on a concentric than an eccentric. So having eccentrics kind of get at your, at your question is something that's, that's important for that. Um, the other thing that uh, is really, uh, it's, it's funny because it seems to be missed a lot, but when you change exercises or when you do different exercises, even if it's comparing an easy bar curl versus a dumbbell curl, people will just look at those biomechanically and say, well, you know, it's, it's elbow flexion, so it's these muscles that are involved. You know, if the angle of supination of the, the palm is the same, well, it's, it's going to be the exact same in terms of the activation pattern, but it's certainly not. Um, so you, you see this, you can look at Per Tesh has a book called Muscle Meets Magnet, which I re refer all the time. It's very, very cool. Um, and Per Tesh is a legend in Sweden. Um, so he's really well known. He's still out there, you know, doing research. I think he may be a professor emeritus by this time, but great guy from what I understand. And, uh, so you see that for instance, in the, in the muscles of the quad, when you do different leg press versus squat versus the knee extension versus any type of quad exercise, you're going to see different activation patterns across those muscles. You see the same thing in an EMG when you, for instance, compare even producing the same amount of elbow flexion force against an isometric dynamometer versus holding that same load in space. The EMG will be actually higher with the free weight because you've, you've got a balancing act that you're trying to perform there. Um, to some degree. So free weights versus machines, different exercises, different angles, all the things that Charles Glass does, they're all evoking novelty of activation. And the way I sort of see it is that progressive overload, which is what we sort of refer back to as being so important for, for muscle growth, is really a form of novelty. You're exposing the muscle to a, a, a more intense in terms of load. Um, or a greater volume in terms of the number of reps, stress for a given set. So 100 pounds for 11 reps versus 10 is, is ind indicates that progressive overload has been achieved. If you use 110 pounds for 10 reps, that's better than 100 pounds for 10 reps, progressive overload. But th that's a novelty of stress in that it's, it superseded the previous stress stimulus that you had. Well, you can also cause a novelty of stress just by doing a different exercise. So variety is one of your basic training principles. And someone who, who, who does this, who, who's maybe been doing a, a deadlift with the barbell for, you know, an eight-week training blast or, you know, several months, and then they go to doing a, bar, a deadlift with a, on a Smith machine or like on a leverage machine, they'll get, so you'll get substantially more sore, even though you're, you, the, the, the number of reps that you're using and the number of sets and the extent to which you gave it your all and how many uh, effective reps you had or how many reps in reserve you kept, those all things could be different. You should literally just changing the exercise can produce muscle soreness where it wasn't before. And that's because the activation pattern is different. So there's a study by Fonterra that people often refer to looking at the muscle of the quad, specifically muscles, and they found growth in all of those when they rotated exercises over the course of the training program as opposed to sticking to just a few exercises. So variety is the spice of life and um, the spice of training and muscle growth, I think, too. This is not to say you should just like randomly haphazardly do different exercises every time you go in the gym, but I think there's a component to that. Um, one, just having some variety amongst those that you can feel you have a good mind-muscle connection with um, and progressing on those as well. So having some moving through some exercises that work for you progressively in a way that overloads over the course of time is sort of the way to go. So 
little variety, little progressive overload, and those two things together um, can really, can really, uh, for someone who hasn't done that, has been like really dogmatic. Like I have to squat for my legs. It's like, oh, so you've been squatting for years and your legs have gotten so big. Tell you what, take, if you've been doing that for five years, take two years and just do hack squats. You take your hack squat from four plates to seven plates. I bet you'll see, and, but keep squatting, maintain that, add, keep that in there, but add in that other exercise, you'll probably will see some growth in that situation. And for uh, finishing on the, uh, the training uh, subject, uh, I want to know, I know you, uh, you train uh, with and you train uh, uh, David Henry for a couple of years. Uh, what, what is it like to train uh, uh, a top uh, Olympia contender? He's like driving a like Ferrari, like you know, like <laughs> just it's funny because Dave, and Dave rightfully so he has this perception that he can make changes um, in a way that other people who don't have g his genetics just don't. Like he, he can he can get really really lean relatively easily. Um, there's so many aspects to Dave that are just sort of extraordinary. Um, here's a funny story. So I don't know if I ever told the story before, but like. We were on a trip. We were going to Vegas, I think, for the USA's years ago. So I lived in Tucson with Dave, and, and Vegas is like an eight-hour trip, roughly. And uh, Dave wanted to just get there as soon as possible. He didn't want to stop and have to, you know, get food or whatever, go to the bathroom. So I think we had to stop once for gas. But Dave just – and he could just do this because um, his metabolism allowed this. He just decided – he had like like a – Costco-sized family bag of Doritos. He loves Doritos. I've just sort of noticed this over time. And he's just decided he'd eat, like, that was all he was going to eat. So he just was driving. I think we had a van. Maybe it was his. We rented it. And he just ate, like, he must, it must have been, you know, 10 grams of sodium at least. It was the whole bag. <laughs> And he didn't hold any water. There was no, it wasn't, he didn't have cankles the next day when he woke up. Like, his, you know, his calves and ankles merged together. That's what cankles are. Mm -hmm. Um And he just, like, it didn't impact him at all. So he, it's just, he, has great, he has great genetics for water metabolism. He can get dry really easily. He up, grows really easily. Um, he was great to train with. It's funny, I was just talking with um, a, fr a friend of mine, Mike Gustafsson. He'll probably watch this. He's uh, originally from Sweden. He's competed from the in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and he got his NABA Pro Card in 2011, I think it was. He's a Masters Mr. Universe. So he's been around the block a few times and uh, we were talking about when Dave and, and Mike and I were doing DC training and that was one of his best growth cycles. And he said, and part of that was just the fact that it was, and I was sort of analyzing, it's like, well, Mike, Mike's been, and Mike's trained with some absolute badasses. He's trained in some hardcore gyms. He, Mike trained in a gym once, if, if I remember the story, like there was no air conditioning, there was no heating, all the windows were busted out. This was in Sweden and literally there would be snow and you'd have to, shovel pass between the machines to get to, from machine to machine. And there was always a plate on the bar. They didn't ever use quarters. They just used plates. So if you're going to squat, you're going to go single, one plate, two plate, like 20 kilo plates, 45 pound plates. That's just how it was. There's no like, you know, just, they just big, go big or go home. So it's, it's Mike who's never going to give up. And me and I just love to be an idiot in the gym and just kind of go bonkers. And there's Dave, you know, it's just this amazing physique and strong as shit. So that, that dynamic was just awesome, but in part because it always gave me something to kind of shoot for. It's like people get motivated. They watch like Ronnie Coleman, you know, um, videos before they go into the gym. Well, I had that right in front of me the entire time, you know. I'd actually come back and watch a Ronnie video. I'm like, hey, he's not that impressive because I just came <laughs> with Dave, you know. So there was extraordinarily motivating in a certain sense, but it also gave me a, a, a tremendous sort of perspective. And um, I'll just tell, I'm, I think I probably have a different listenership here with you to some degree. So I'll, I'll tell the story. It was, um, I think it was 2009 and it, yeah, it must've been, and Dave had just won the 202 Mr. Olympia the year before. And we were both were dieting down. I was, I was getting ready for the Mr. Arizona. So my, so my state show, And I, I had maybe, I think I maybe had won my, my class once, maybe hadn't even won my class. I'm just trying to become, like, win the heavyweight in the, in the state-level NPC show. And I've been training with Dave now for five or six years at least. And so we, were, we would train, and then we'd go and we'd pose, and you know, I'd let him go through the ringer, and then I would go through the ringer. And 
So we're standing there, we're pretty tired and dieted down, and, and Dave just kind of casually looks over at the mirror and he, he says, it's like, you know, man, it's just, it's amazing. Like we've been training together, you know, and eating a lot of the same foods and everything, and our bodies just look so different. And I'm like, yes, Dave, I've noticed that. You're the reigning 202 Mr. Olympia, and I can't even win my state show. So he didn't, like, he didn't say that in any bad way. It wasn't derogatory whatsoever. It was just a casual, you know, observation, which was dead on. And I just realized, you know, no matter what I do, no matter how much I know, there's going to be a genetic limitation to some degree. So that was actually really good. Like that, like talk about an ego check, boom, like get back in the box, Mr. Ego. You have no business here because that's the guy who's like got the genetics and this is what you have. So that was, um. Uh, it made me realize that, made me realize that I'm going to maybe have to work harder than some other people who have better genetics, and uh, but it also made training a lot of fun too. So, um, yeah, it was good. It was good. And coaching Dave's great. You know, we still I help him to varying degrees over the years. Some shows not so much. Uh, lately, we've been staying in good contact. I think I just sent him a message this morning or yesterday. So, um, yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been really nice to be able to just because he's so well known. And uh, his physique is just, you know, totally off the chain. It's been mm-hmm. kind of a blessing to have met Dave in the gym. We just started training as, you know, two dudes. Um, he hadn't even competed yet. He just gotten his pro card when we met. So, yeah, we've been at it for a while. Nice. And uh, can you talk a little bit uh, quickly of your, uh, your view on nutrition with your, your type of training and supplementation? Yeah, so uh, we just, I just did a, a roundtable podcast asked on these um that uh, a lot of people are watching it just keep getting tagged in story after story listening to this uh i have i sort of come to a nutrient timing type of um way of doing the the nutrient accounting so to speak um uh as a sort of a baseline approach doesn't have to be the case for everyone but um so what i found basically is that the i try to sort of match the nutrition to the metabolic demands um, that are present at the time. So what this basically means is that on a day you've trained, um, you've just used up glycogen, you've just just set into motion these adaptive processes which involve more protein synthesis, greater sensitivity to incoming amino acids in terms of how well they turn on protein synthesis. And so it makes sense to me during that time that you feed the machine as much as you can Not that you want to starve it at other times necessarily, unless that's part of what you're doing for a, um, a contest prep. So the way that I've sort of been explaining it uh, more recently is, is let's say take an off season. And for a given individual, there's a caloric intake of 4,000 calories a day that was going to give them a good rate of gain so that they've got a good P ratio of muscle mass to body fat. So If they go to 4,500, they start gaining a lot of fat. That's too fast. You can only turn on muscle, muscle uh, protein synthesis. You can only gain muscle at a certain rate. So, I mean, literally, if you break it down uh, on a daily basis, if you consider muscle to be about three quarters water, so an ounce of muscle is like 28 grams, and you can have a, a protein balance, a positive protein balance of seven grams per day. So that means that if someone takes in 207 grams of protein, then 200 of that is oxidized and, se- and used elsewhere. It ends up uh, replacing the protein that's been broken down, but they have a net accumulation, a net balance of 7 grams. And that's just, that's 30 calories worth of, that's 28 calories worth of protein. That's nothing. That gives them an ounce of muscle mass a day, and that ends up being like 22 or 25 pounds of muscle in a year not very much now of course there's an energy demand there too it's not as if you know you, you, it doesn't take any energy to construct that skeletal muscle and plus you have to do some pretty especially if you've been training for a while some pretty extreme things in order to make new muscle and produce that growth but that's a very small balance that you're trying to evoke and it may take a lot of food to do that so anyway back to this this person who's at 4,000 calories being sort of what they've figured out gives them a good ratio of muscle to fat. And then 
if you think about what you need to do on days that you train versus days you don't train, well, I would say that if I had to pick a day um, where I want to bring more calories in, make sure I've got plenty of protein available for the reason I just mentioned, those days are going to be the days that I train. You're still recovering on the non-training days, so you don't want to not take in adequate protein. But if you've replenished your carbohydrate and your glycogen levels are relatively full, which they're going to be probably anyway, no matter what you do, if you're eating enough and you're not on a low-carb diet during your off-season, then what? And there's, so there's going to be an ebb and flow in terms of the protein synthesis that's going on, the rate of muscle accumulation, and also you want to counter muscle breakdown to some degree. It makes sense to me, just from that sort of theoretical perspective, to use a nutrient timing approach so that, you know, maybe you're doing 4,400 calories on uh, training days and 3,600 calories on non-training days or something like that. You may train four days a week versus three days a week, but more calories on training days makes more sense to me, in particular during that post-workout period when you've got increased insulin sensitivity, you've got increased sensitivity to uh, amino acids. So there's, there's something there. The counter argument people would say, well, where's the evidence to suggest that works? And there's actually, there are some, there is some evidence out there. The main thing that worth considering is for me is like, is there evidence that, that eating in that way is, is harmful, is deleterious? Probably not. So maybe it gives you one or 2%. Well, let's see if it gives me 1%, what is, what is seven grams versus of 200 or 207 grams of protein. Well, that's, that's three and a half percent. Now, if I can, I'm just, these, these are weird numbers. We'll just play with the numbers for a little while, just for the sake of thinking it through. So what if I go from two and a half gram, two and a half grams to three and a half grams or 2% to three and a half percent or five grams positive protein balance to seven grams positive protein balance. You know, that's, that's a very, very small amount in terms of the relative changes in protein balance. Two grams is, is nothing, but two grams, if we use the math I just went through, two grams could mean eight or five or eight pounds of muscle over the course of a year. You add that up, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> Give it to me. Give me two pounds of muscle at my age. I've been doing this for a while. I'll take whatever I can get. So I'd like to use that um, just for that reason. There are some good studies that, um, that I've talked about before. There's a, a Crib and Hayes study. There's a set of studies by Bird, B-U-R-D. Darren Willoughby has done some work in this area too, where they've done a nice job of, of finding that actually it's just the timing aspect of nutrient timing, bringing in basically an intra-workout, um, either giving feedings throughout or before and after versus, for instance, giving the same feedings of protein and carbohydrates in the morning and at night. So the calories end up being the same at least in terms of, of a reha recall um, subjects provided. So it's not changing calories in any way necessarily. It's just the timing per se that makes sense. And theoretically looking what protein does, what carbohydrates do, at least in terms of glycogen, whether they're impacting um, protein synthesis is another issue. Um, this, the, what came up in the podcast was this particular study by Staples, for instance, that suggests that taking in carbohydrate during a workout with protein doesn't increase the protein synthetic response that's brought on by the protein. But remember, that's a singular session. And we know that those singular sessions, like at the beginning of a training period, are not a very good way to predict what's going to happen in terms of muscle growth because you've got this repeated bout effect. You've got so much soreness going on. A lot of that protein synthesis is just going into recovery from what's a novel stimulus. So I don't take that study, um, that singular study, although it was well done, um, the, some of this follow-up information as to how well that can be applied to the long term tells me that um, what I found with clients and myself, and just the other advantage of taking in carbohydrate um, and keeping glycogen levels full makes sense. So I tend to use that kind of an approach. There's probably also an impact on insulin sensitivity. So if you've got someone, I will very much do this. I'll take someone after a contest and just start adding food to an intra-workout and, and the two meals post-workout. It's like a six to eight hour window. This is what I have outlined in the Fortitude Training Book. I have a demonstration of kind of a, a multiple weeks of dieting with someone 
in my uh, Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach book where I sort of show how this is done. And um, I will add food there and build upon that while keeping what could very possibly be for many months a uh, pre-contest level of food intake on non-training days. So someone trains um, four times a week, they may, their non-training day diet may be very much the same for the first couple months after a show. And it, my experience has been, and people who've taken this on who give me feedback, clients and other coaches, is that it does a really good job of keeping people lean, um, which sort of makes sense if you think about it in terms of insulin sensitivity. You're storing that during those non-training days. Um, so uh, I really, that, that's a very nice advantage there. It's also, it, it's a very easy way to account, to do the accounting. You're just adding on singular meals. And the other thing that I like to just as a global approach when I'm adding food outside of that is I pay attention to what the body is telling me. So um, there will be certain meals during the day. And of course, this is, this, these are small percentages here, but there'll be certain meals where you're maybe hurting. So let's say someone gets up in the morning and they're not, the day after training, um, they've just had big meals, they're not very hungry. They have a, a get enough protein just to sort of get themselves at a negative protein balance in the morning for breakfast, and then they maybe have another mid morning meal. And but they're off to work, so maybe they they walk to the bus station because they live in the UK or someplace where they don't really need a car. So they do a lot of activity. Their job keeps them busy. Maybe it's something they do at the first part of the day. They're busy, and they have a, a same sized meal for lunch, or what seems like to be plenty uh, plenty of food for lunch but it's the meal that's the least satisfying meal for them during the day. So I'll have people report back to me what their levels of satisfaction are, either in terms of how much hunger they have before the meal or how well it fills them up. And we use the body then, the body's own feedback, to tell us where to add food. So the worst thing you'd want to do is, let's say, add food to, the, to a meal where you're already full afterwards. There's no, there's no point in that. It actually could possibly even create stress. It's like, God, I hate this meal. I just, I don't want to have to overeat this meal. I'm not hungry for this meal. That's not the meal to add food to. It's better probably to add food according to what the body is telling you. Because um, it's not as if we can just, you know, force the body to do everything we wish it to. It, it makes sense to work as much as you can with the body's own homeostatic mechanisms. So I add food there. Um, and, and allow the person to, to, uh, to sort of meter in their own food as we add food to those non-training days or other meals. This fits well with the um, uh, sort of the, the protein timing. There's, uh, there's an idea that has been put forth, and it makes sense in several, several studies that it's better to have protein meals spread out throughout the day. Um, protein pacing is the name of the, the concept, which you can find if you dig in the literature. Just go to PubMed, and you can, you can look some of that up. So having protein and having food spread throughout the day, I think, makes sense um, just for that reason. So I'll pay attention to the person's appetite, where, where they can add to, where they can't. Another thing that I like to do, for instance, is take advantage of the body's diurnal patterning. So you'll find if someone, let's say they train at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock when they get off of work, so their meals are big during the end of the day they'll fall into that pattern on the non-training days where their hunger is higher. And so you can take advantage of that. So let's say someone, uh, we've gone through weeks or months of dieting and we've really added that post-workout period. They're taking in big meals then. Um, and then they sort of top out like I can't get any, any more in. So we start to add food. Um, either if there's some meals that they're really hungry for, we'll add there probably first. But if they really can't tell on a non-training day, We'll add food during that post-workout, that end-of-the-day period, which would be post-workout on training days. And a lot of times that'll just kind of come up. They'll just end up being more hungry. So you start adding food there on the non-training days, and somehow even though the overall food intake of the diet has gotten higher, that will open up a little bit the, the post-workout meals on the training days. They'll then be able to add some more, and it's because we're – we're really sort of reinforcing that circadian rhythm of more food during those times. And um, ask somebody like a bodybuilder who's been, you probably experienced this, you, you're used to eating every three, three hours, and literally you get to like three and a half hours, you're like friggin' starving, you know? And some of that could just be psychological. 
Um, probably a lot of it is, but some of it could be just the fact that your body's sort of fallen into that rhythm. So I want to take advantage of that as much as possible because we're doing so many things to force the body to adapt. The more we can do to sort of roll with the body's feedback, the better, I think. Perfect. And I think uh, if people want to know more, uh, there's uh, plenty of uh, good stuff in the uh, Fortitude Training uh, book and the uh, Be Your Own Bodybuilding uh, Coach also. Yeah. So uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, where awesome. can people uh, find uh, more on you? Like I said, you can just Google uh, Scott yeah. Stevenson of Bodybuilding. BYOBBcoach.com get you to the book or just drscottstevenson.com, D-R. S O T T, my last name. dot com. We'll get you there too. All right, uh, perfect. Thank you for your time and have a good day. You're welcome, my man.